So today we have our special guest, Dr. Noah Moss, who is um, a cardiologist and a very specific heart failure specialist here at SIDA. He's a busy evening. So if you could all please silence your phones, that would be great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry I'm late. Um, so we'll be talking about medical management of acute heart failure. Try to give you some new updates, perhaps, uh, going on with acute heart failure. Um, I do work in the advanced heart failure department uh, with heart failure, transplant LVADs. Um, and, of course, uh, we'll talk at the end. But anyone, feel free to reach out at any time if we need help from our service. We may not always be the friendliest people, but we try to be. We're busy, but we always have time to help whoever needs help. So. Uh, so we'll go through the epide epidemiology of acute heart failure, especially inpatient heart failure assessment, management, and prognosis associated with heart failure hospitalizations. So this is a mandatory slide to show how bad a problem we have with uh, heart failure. So, you know, over the country, greater than a million hospitalizations, greater than three million um, hospitalizations have heart failure as a contributor. We have a length of stay that's probably too long. We have readmission rates that are way too high. Um, and a lot of costs associated with heart failure hospitalizations, and the cost is just going to be increasing exponentially, estimated to be $70 billion by 2013. Um, and most of these costs are attributed to um, hospitalizations. So what, is, um, what are these contributors? Who are these patients being admitted for heart failure? So it is, in patients greater than 65, it is the most common cause for hospitalization. Uh, these are looking at different registries and different trials, looking at which patients were included. And we do see uh, mainly elderly patients, both men and women, um, prior heart failure, hospitalizations, that's a common thing, um, mixed between low ejection fractions, so HEF-PEF and HEF-REF, both patients are admitted frequently to the hospital, um, and several comorbid conditions, including coronary disease, hypertension, diabetes, AFib and renal disease. Um, as we know, these are typically sick patients, and the heart is not the only problem. Especially, you know, special group of population, especially the HEFPEF population, uh, these are definitely elderly females. That is the most common presentation for HEFPEF, and uh, frequently with diabetes and uh, renal insufficiency as well. So these are sick patients. So how do we assess these patients? You know, this is a uh, chart. Ooh. Oh, a uh, chart created by uh, Dr. Stevenson, um, where the best way is probably to group a patient into one of these categories when you assess a patient. Uh, based on your initial assessment, you could plan management from there. So the warm and dry patient is obviously the patient who's not congested nor hypoperfused. So this is your ambulatory heart failure patient who's doing well. Probably the most common patient we see uh, in the hospital is the warm and wet patient, the patient who is congested, and we'll go through what the signs of congestion are, um, but they are perfusing their organs well. Um, then the sickest type of patient is probably the cold and dry patient. That's someone who, def despite being volume optimized uh, with no congestion, but they're still hyperperfusing. So they have signs of cold extremities, oliguria, mental confusion, dizziness, narrow pulse pressure, and so on. Um, and in, not infrequently, especially in, on our service, we see the cold and wet patient, the patient that comes in uh, decompensated, congested, and as well not perfusing the organs. And again, it's nice to place the patient when you assess them into these categories to decide how you will treat the patient. So what are our signs of congestion? Um, probably the most uh, specific signs we have are the elevated jugular venous pressure. Um, which if you rotate on our service or if you've seen our service, uh, we spend a lot of time assessing that. Patients are wondering why we're staring at their neck for uh, five minutes and everyone coming to look. It does appear strange at first. Um, an S3, which again is a, um, a cardiac finding that can be difficult to hear, especially I think um, nowadays we become um, less reliant on the physical exam and probably we're losing the art at some of these things. And then the ones we see typically edema, uh, pleural effusions, and pulmonary edema on x-rays, although in a heart failure patient, these are not always, uh, many uh, heart failure patients will not have pulmonary edema on x-rays or pleural effusions. And then ascites would be a sign of decompensated right heart failure. Symptoms we should ask for in our history, we all know this, but dyspnea, fatigue, uh, some things that may indicate a more advanced state of disease, such as early satiety or nausea where the patients are not perfusing uh, their abdominal organs. Um, abdominal fullness, edema, and then one we'll discuss a little bit more 
of bendopnea, which is uh, dyspnea when bending down. And that actually, if you start asking your patients more about that, you'll see it is actually quite a common symptom in heart failure. We'll take another look at it. Um, labs that can be important, sodium, uh, low sodium is known as a, uh, you know, it's a prognostic indicator in heart failure patients, low, uh, hyponatremia. Uh, renal function, of course, that could be a sign of hyperperfusion. It's one of our best measurements of hyperperfusing an organ is, uh, are the kidneys. Um, again, it could also be a sign of what we call renal congestion, if you believe in that. Um, liver function. Uh, both from congestion or from low output state, uh, natriuretic peptides, which we'll spend a bit of time on later, and then uh, lactate, again, could be another sign of hypoperfusion with these patients. Um, looking at what are our best measures, you know, what we'll see from here is none of our uh, clinical exam findings oh, sorry, are that sensitive or uh, that specific. Um, as I said, uh, JVP, which is an estimate of your right atrial pressure, uh, while it is specific, if you see it, it's not a very sensitive finding. Um, similar with an S3. Again, if you hear it, it's a sign of an it could be a sign of an elevated wedge pressure, but not a very sensitive sensitive finding uh, um, as well. So if we just rely on our physical exam or clinical, you know, on our physical physical exam alone, we will miss a lot of patients who are in decompensated heart failure, and it just shows our limited ability to detect that in our patients, no matter how good you are. I mentioned the bendopnea before. I just want to mention again to highlight it. Um, and it's, as I said, the definition is shortness of breath when bending forward. Um, you'll find it in about 30% of heart failure patients, and it is a good, associ it's, it's associated with elevated filling pressures, um, and it's not just patients who have big bellies, that's why they're going short of breath, and it's also been associated with higher uh, peak VO2s, which is a sign of a more advanced state uh, patient, or VVCO2s. Um, some, you know, some scores that have been suggested to actually measure congestion in these patients, and this has been looked at. Um, when you are uh, looking back on some trials that were done are the orthedema score. You take edema and you take orthopnea and you create a score to see if you've actually unloaded your patient or judge congestion based on that score, uh, ranging from zero to four. And it has been shown to have prognostic value. Um, then, you know, at, at discharge, 50 percent of only 50 percent of patients are orthedema free. Um, and those patients who were did have lower uh, 60 event rates when you look back on the dose and caress trials, which were two large acute heart failure management trials. Another important thing is always to assess what drove this patient into heart failure. Um, here's a whole list of things which, you know, you could ask certain questions in the history to assess for. Um, can it just be um, someone to, who's getting sick as time goes on? Nothing specific that they did, but they're just uh, getting sick. Are there valvular disease, arrhythmias, hypertension, um, you know, poor dietary compliance, um, perhaps more rare things such as a shunt, anemia, septicemia, um, and so on. And we could all go through this list and just uh, look for clues in the history that would, would indicate one of these things. So what leads to someone to get uh, into a decompensated state? It's, it's not very clear completely, but someone with abnormal function that, ha that does have a trigger uh, can lead to increased activation of the ren, ren and angiotensin aldosterone system, uh, reduced cardiac output, uh, endothelial activation, and a whole host of things that can result in, bottom line, increased filling pressures. Um, and you could go from someone who is not symptomatic um, to someone who has signs and symptoms of congested heart failure. And this process probably starts more than 30 days or 60 days prior to them coming to the hospital. They've been slowly uh, decompensating the state even before, you, much before you see them. The problem is we don't have the we we don't have the tools commonly to pick up that early congestion. Although I'll show you some things that we've been working on. How do we treat heart failure patients uh, when they do come into the hospital? Now, uh, for those who have heard of the DOSE trial, the DOSE trial is a trial where they randomize patients to low versus high dose diuretics. And we say high dose diuretics, that was 2.5 times the oral dose in IV formulation, so a very high dose of diuretics. Um, and they also looked at what's better, a continuous infusion or IV bolus of these medications. So uh, when the trial was done, they showed no difference in the outcomes of uh, symptoms or change in the renal function. But the high dose group had what they measured as dyspnea relief. They did feel uh, and change in weight and fluid loss. So perhaps we're not losing anything by doing this to these patients. Although there was a transient worsening of the renal function, um, it did uh, it did all recover back to baseline. So no matter how you treated the patient, um, it didn't make such a big difference. Except to uh, you did achieve maybe some more dyspnea relief and weight change and so on. 
So I think the way we look at it is you're not losing anything by giving high dose diuretics and perhaps it could be helped. Although also in the trial there was no change in uh, time to discharge or readmission rates, uh, which was surprising. Um, but I don't know if you, I think the signs are down, but it used to be 80 is the new 40. So to give patients higher dose diuretics up front when they come into the hospital. Um, another issue we deal with commonly in the hospital is diuretic unresponsiveness. You, you'll see these patients you're giving the high dose diuretics to, but they're just not responding to it. And, and the way maybe to define it is a poor response within 30 to 60 minutes. If someone's given an IV, IV diuretics, they should be urinating within that time. If they're not, uh, certain things to think of, maybe they do need a higher dose diuretic. Um, consider changing the diuretic. You know, now we have in the hospital formulary is torsamide, which, which we never used to have. So there'd be metanide and torsamide. Um, they both have better bio bioavailability than furosemide. They have a longer half-life. There's other potential antifibrotic effects um, and other beneficial effects that are currently being studied. Um, but I personally moved a lot to just treating these patients with torsemide, especially the patients that are, you know, chronically congested, you would say, because it, it really does work better. Um, and patients respond to it much better, especially when they're failing on furosemide. So I think it's something to turn to now, especially that it's on formulary in the hospital, it's uh, easier to use. Um, sorry, uh, before I did, also always think about adding a distal loop diuretic such as metolazone or chlorothiazide. Um, <laughs> these are always, uh, when you've reached a very high dose of diuretic and the patient is still not responding, I think it's something you could jump to as well. Um, in the ROSE AHF trial, they looked at dopamine. You know, dopamine has been thought as, you know, somewhat of a benign drug. It maybe it will help, you know, renal dose dopamine we've all heard of. Can we help um, perfuse the kidneys better while also enhancing diure diuresis? Uh, so in, the, in, in this trial, it really did not enhance diuresis or preserve renal function um, in patients who already had some renal dysfunction. Uh, they did look at a sub-study of this trial, again, a sub-study of a study, so uh, take it uh, with a grain of salt. But patients who had low ejection fractions, there was an association with increased urine output, weight loss, and improved clinical outcomes. Um, so it's something that you could give peripherally, perhaps on the floor, so it's something to consider. But again, not good data behind it. Um, the Athena heart failure trial looked at high-dose spironolactone uh, given early on in the hosp hospitalization um, compared to no or low-dose spironolactone and really didn't find any difference in weight loss or duration of the hospitalization. Um, um, so again, really a negative trial looking at that. And what about heart failure patients? What should we know about them when we are diuresing them? You know, I think a common thing we hear is, oh, be careful, uh, the patient's blood pressure is low, we shouldn't give diuretics with it, with it low. Um, uh, but if you do look, um, if, you, if you look at this, uh, you know, stroke volume uh, versus pressure curve over here, what you can see, while other, you know, normal patients or with increased contractility, as you increase uh, your preload, you do, it does result in an increase in the stroke volume, but it's really not like that in heart failure patients. Um, even by increasing preload, you're not getting that much increase in your stroke volume, but you will send the patient into pulmonary edema with that increased fluid. Alternatively, hypotension only develops really at this end of the curve. So you really have to dry out a heart failure patient to render them um, hypotensive. So I think the takeaway is if a patient is sitting in front of you um, and he is congested, don't worry about the blood pressure, give them the diuretics, which is the treatment that they need, and it could pot uh, potentially even help the patient. Um, other things that have been looked at to remove fluid, ultrafiltration. Uh, we actually, in this hospital, I think we're the biggest user of ultrafiltration in the country, or at least in New York City. Part of that is mainly because of CT surgery, uh, not so much on the medicine side. Um, but it's removal of water itself from a uh, semi-permeal membrane. So you're, you're removing water, uh, from the blood. Um, and if you've seen it, it comes out as just this yellow solution that comes out of the blood. Um, and this has been studied extensively in several trials. The unload trial uh, showed that you did have greater fluid loss, but there really wasn't change in this dyspnea relief measure. Um, you know, some criticism of the trial is that there was only a moderate diuretic dose used in the control arm of that trial. So perhaps with higher diuretics, they could have had equivalent outcomes. Um, the CARES trial looked at patients who have worsening renal function but persistently volume overloaded. What about putting these patients on ultrafiltration? Um, and uh, as part of the primary outcome was worsening creatinine, and really this strategy did lead to worsening creatinine, so therefore it resulted in increased adverse events for this population. Um, what about Then there was another trial, AVOID HF, that was just stopped early by the sponsors for various reasons. Uh, but things to think about, it's not a benign thing. You have to put vascular access into these patients. 
Um, it requires a lot of nursing support. These cartridges always clot. I just need someone by the bedside and managing them. It's extremely expensive. I, I think each cartridge is about $1,000 or two, and you could go through many cartridges in a day. And um, while anticoagulation is not required, it's not even by the company, anecdotally what we see is if you're not on anticoagulation, these things clot very easily. So again, you're always, these are sick patients and there's a potential increase in bleeding risk with this. So I, I don't think it's fallen to favor much. We, there are situations we do use it, but like I said, most commonly it is post, uh, post-operatively that I see it used where uh, you have less of an effect than using something like CVH because you're removing uh, volume at a slower level with a smaller... Um, you know, smaller size catheter and so on. Um, so what about at the, what do the guidelines say about it? So they, you know, they give a, this is I think a class 2A recommendation, ultra, class 2B, ultrafiltration may be considered for patients with obvious volume overload uh, to alleviate congestion and flu away, probably based on the unload study uh, where it didn't really have any, um, it, it was safe compared to just diuretics, um, and also may be considered for patients with refractory congestion not responding to medical therapy, but again, it's just a level of evidence C because there's really been no study to prove its benefit. What about medical management in our heart failure patients? Um, so, you know, the, what I wanted to get across in this slide is just really the importance of initiation, initiation of neurohormonal antagonists prior to discharge. Um, the optimized heart failure registry was a registry that looked at, uh, it chose five ACC AHA recommendations to implement into practice and how do using the guidelines affect outcomes. Um, and what they found was among the five things, the only one that actually led to improved outcomes was the initiation of an ACE inhibitor ARB for patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction was found to be a positive predictor of, of reduction in risk for, or mortality for rehospitalization. So it really showed a lot of benefit in using these ACE inhibitors or ARBs in these patients uh, with LV dysfunction. Um, and again, this wasn't part of the, the recommendation guidelines, but they did found, find in the study as well that uh, beta blockers in LG patients was highly predictive of improved post-discharge survival. So although that's not what they were looking for, they did find that even initiating beta blockers prior to discharge uh, can be very helpful. Um, you know, talking about beta blockers, the impact uh, heart failure trial, it looked at what happens if you, um, you know, starting carvedilol in the hospital. And really what it found was um, patients who are placed on it are much more likely to be on it uh, 60 days later. So 91% versus 72%. So a huge difference in, in patients being on the medicine later. And there really wasn't any increased side effects or length of stay related to this. Um, so the bottom line is if you start these medicines in the hospital, they're more likely to be on them later on. Um, and we do know that these medicines are extremely helpful um, in heart failure patients. So I think it's our job is to really get the patients on the medicines, even if it's a low dose, let, allow the, the outpatient physician to up titrate them later on, but at least start the medicine. Um, and just in terms of spironolactone, there was a you know data from the COACH trial, which is a whole separate study, but did see that um, significantly fewer 30-day mortality in heart failure rehospitalizations uh, in patients who were started on aldactone in the hospital. And this even held true in high-risk patients. And when part of the high-risk patients was patients with worse, uh, with, uh, worse uh, kidney disease. So I know we're all, me as well, we're hesitant to start spinal lactone in these patients Sorry with, the, with bad kidney disease. Uh, but even in those patients, it did show, to, it, especially in those patients, it showed to be some benefit. The thing I would caution with spinal lactone, make sure this is a patient who's going to follow up because it really does lead to hyperkalemia. So you don't want to fall. You don't want to start it unless you know the patient will be seen within one to two weeks of discharge. Um, and based on these studies and others, it is recommended that guideline direct medical therapy be continued uh, upon admission to the hospital again in the absence of any hemod hemodynamic issues. And really, that initiation of beta blocker therapy is is recommended um, after you optimize the patient and they're not again uh, very sick patients with intravenous diuretics, vasodilators, or inotropes. Um, so just to, to, to keep that always in mind, to start these medications when you can. Um, so when I, whenever I speak about this topic or others, people always ask, what about Entresto in the hospital? Um, what should we be doing with Entresto? So uh, this is the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, which was the landmark trial looking at Entresto, which is a combination of Sacubitril Valsartan with Enalapril. Um, and it showed a tremendous benefit in heart failure patients. It, you know, it was positive for every... Um, you know, every outcome that they studied. So it uh, reduced the combined endpoint of death or first hospitalization, CV death, first hospitalization for worsening heart failure, 
and it even uh, was it even reduced all cause mortality. So really, an amazing uh, trial that they did with this drug, and showed tremendous benefit. As an outpatient, I'm using the drug a lot, but the, there is always concern about what to do with the drug inpatient. Um, one thing that came out of the trial, there weren't really much more adverse events. There was more hypotension with Entresto in the trial, um, but uh, it didn't lead to more discon discontinuation. So take that for whatever it's worth, but there definitely was. And anecdotally, in my use, it really, you know, some patients just can't tolerate it, especially the patients with borderline blood pressure. They just can't tolerate it. They could tolerate their low dose ACE or R, but they just can't tolerate the Entresto. So I don't think it's a benign medicine, but I think if it's done in the right way, it could be of extreme benefit for your patients. Um, how much interest is being ordered on the floors? And you're not a lot. Is it available in the hospital? Yeah, it's now available in the hospital. Yeah, you can prescribe it. It's on formula in the hospital. Yeah. So any patient who comes on it should be continued as long as you think it's safe, obviously. But uh, we can order it for patients now. Um, so th this is a new trial that just came out. Uh, it was an abstract at the ESC, actually. So they looked at what about starting in Tresto in the hospital. Um, it's called the transition trial. It was more just a you know safety trial, but it was randomized to starting a pre versus post discharge. They didn't randomize it against um, an ACE or an ARB. I guess they thought it was it's always been proven to be better than these drugs. Um, so really, the and the, the endpoint was uh, looking at which patients achieved the target dose of 200 milligrams uh, BID, which is the maximum dose of the medicine at 10 weeks. Um, and to just assess how patients tolerated it and uh, how many patients discontinued it. Um, uh, so really, you know, what came out of the trial is that most patients uh, ended up uh, being on it, um, uh, and half of the patients achieved the maximum dose within 10 weeks. So again, that's positive. Based on what we know about starting these me medicines in the hospital, it can be a benefit. Um, adverse events uh, were similar between the pre- and post-discharge group. I listed here the adverse events. So, you know, 11% hyperkalemia, 12% hypotension, um, which, which does sound a lot sound like a lot. Again, how much of this is attributed to the drug or not? I think looking back on the Paradigm trial, it really was not that different com compared to ACE inhibitor studied in, in that trial. So um, so it does seem, you know, bottom line, that it is safe to start it. Um, the patients who did tolerate it better, though, were the patients with fewer comorbidities, um, higher blood pressures, or newly diagnosed heart failure were the ones that uh, were shown to tolerate it better. Um, or at least get to the maximum dose. My, my practice is this. I, I, I start it, I, I rarely start in Tresto from the beginning. I'll usually start them on an ACE inhibitor or ARB, get them up to a decent dose. So lisinopril, 10 milligrams, you know, losartan even 25 to 50. And once I know they're tolerating that, then I switch them to in Tresto. Right. Sorry. You know, that's the other thing I meant to talk about. Right. The other problem with starting in the hospital is that you don't know if it's going to be covered when they go home. And we've had many cases where it gets ordered in the hospital. Everyone's, oh, this is great for the patient, but then they come back and they're not on anything because they couldn't afford the copay. So most insurances are covering it. Uh, the real issue is the copay. Um, some copays could be $180 a month, and the patients are not going to pay for that. So. You still have to get prior auth on most for most insurance companies. So, one, but even once you get the prior auth, the copay still may be tremendously high, and the patient won't get it. So that's that's the other reason why I definitely start as an outpatient. Look, you know, that you can make sure you monitor and make sure that it gets covered. So I think that's out of anything, that's the most important one. As time goes on, more and more will cover it. It'll become easier to get, but it's gotten much easier in the past two years uh, getting the drug. There's you know, rare patients are denied for it. The issue is really the copay. Um, the other question is, how could I tell if my patient is decongested? So you go through all we talked about, you get you get them diuresis, you get them on the meds, but as we said, our physical exam signs are not great, so you could discuss relief of symptoms, absence of signs, but, you know, these are poor markers. What about weight loss or fluid loss? You know, I think on our floor, you know, 7 Center and 7 West, they do a really good job of measuring weights and fluid. I think it's different on every unit in the hospital. Um, a seven center is excellent at it, and they do the best job they can, but still not all the patients are compliant, so the patient and the staff has to buy into it. Uh, but a recent trial did look at this. What is a better measure, weight loss or fluid loss? Um, and they looked at this. They looked back on, again, trials that were looking at optimizing heart failure therapies, um, and they found that in 55%, only in 55% of cases were weight loss and fluid loss concordant. So when you saw someone 
you know, uh, urinated one, he was negative a total, they were negative a total of one liter, they also lost one kilogram. That only occurred in 55% of cases. It just shows the problem we had. And these were in trial patients, so hospitals that were doing this trial. So imagine, in, you know, not. So, um, but the way they did, they did find is that weight loss but not fluid loss was associated with freedom from congestion, and congestion was made, uh, measured based on congestion scores. Um, so perhaps this shows that you know early changes in weight may be more useful for identifying response to therapy and for predicting outcomes than net fluid output. I, I think weight is only dependent on one person, the person measuring the weight in the morning. Uh, but fluid, <laughs> but fluid is dependent on the patient keeping the urine, the you know proper measuring it multiple times a day. So I think it makes sense overall, but I think it's something to pay attention to. And it is helpful when you think about that on floors that do it properly, is just looking for that weight loss every day and driving towards that weight loss every day. I thought this was an interesting thing, though, you know, that was recently published. Um, what about looking at biomarkers? So BNP, NT, pro BNP, how should we be using these in hospitalized patients, if we should? Um, so this is, you know, an early trial that really proved the use of, uh, you know, BNP in evaluation of patients with heart failure. This was an emergency room study, but they did find that using BNP guided therapy upon presentation to the emergency room uh, did reduce the time to treatment, it reduced the time to discharge, it decreased the hospitalizations, um, it decreased admissions to intensive care units, uh, it decreased costs, it didn't have much change, on, it didn't have any change on 30 day uh, in hospital or mortality or readmission rates, but still a lot of benefit you could get just by checking one test. Um, so, again, maybe on initial evaluation it's helpful, but what about thereafter? Um, this is looking at, uh, again, NT-proBNP NT measurements um, and outcomes after hospital discharge in heart failure patients. So what, what this is, you know, what this is looking at, the change between admission and discharge uh, BNP levels, it really does have good prognost, uh, you know, good prognosticator. If you're able to decrease your, the NT-proBNP by greater than 30%, um, you have a, you know, uh, you know, less uh, hospitalizations following this, and, you know, your uh, cumulative risk of hospitalizations or free survival is much higher. But if you are not able to decrease or only be able to decrease by a small amount, this patient is not going to do well. So I think it's, it could be used as a prognosticator. And many trials uh, bear out the prognostic significance of it. Uh, what's been hard is to find trials that actually show that by using BNP-guided treatment strategies just don't really work. We haven't had a good trial that has shown that. This is an out outpatient trial, also a relatively new one from 2017, uh, the GUIDED trial, where they looked at a biomarker-guided therapy as an outpatient, and there was no change in any of the endpoints. Here we see you know, risk of hospitalizations or cardiovascular death. Um, the same, whether you use it, this strategy or not. So again, disappointing, I think. Um, and you know, this is a trial I found that they looked at it in inpatients. Um, what happens if you check a pre-discharge BNP? So let's say you get the patient stable, they're transitioned to PO diuretics, you think they look good, you check a BNP uh, while planning discharge, do you react to that BNP or not? So half the patients, they react to that BNP. So if the BNP was still elevated, and I think they used a cutoff of uh, 3,000 for this trial, um, or it was 1,000. They, they treated that, and half the patients, they didn't. And really, it didn't lead to any change in outcomes, whether they treated that or not. They, um, and, but what they did show, similar to the other outcomes trial, or the prognosticator, that if you were able to reduce the nt bro p those patients did better. So it didn't really uh, change outcomes in the patient doing it, but again, the same thing has been shown, that it could be used as a good prognosticator. So, and I think we still have not found that it can be used reliably as an inpatient to, to use it. We have, you know, we have, we, we try to encourage everyone to order that uh, BNP prior, prior to discharge. Uh, that's something we've been trying to do. It's in our heart failure protocols. Um, um, and probably for more of that prognostic significance. It also helps, I think, when they come back to the office a week or two weeks later, you check that BNP. Even if the patient looks good and you see it's much higher, I think that is something to very concerning to to um, that that is a very concerning sign. So I do use that. I also use it chronically to follow patients just to make sure there's no significant change in the patient. So I find it helpful, but it is difficult in the inpatient to use it and how we're going to use it. Um, and what that resulted is, you know, in the uh, looking at the guidelines, they say in patients presenting with dyspnea. Um, it could, you could use these to support your diagnosis, which we showed the trials that show that. Uh, measurement of baseline levels uh, upon admission is probably useful to, for prognosis. Um, and uh, during a hospitalization, pre-discharge BMP can be useful to establish a post-discharge prognosis. So again, nothing about treatment in the guidelines, just about prognosis.
Yeah. Yeah. In the hospital, you can really just see me and me. Yeah. You advocate using that, so you use that, and you have data to show that. Yeah. No, you know, so the, the everything you said is true. The problem is the hospital to send out the NT Pro VMP, so it won't come back uh, for two days. So there's no point in, in that way. The, the issue is going to come up in with interest, though. Uh, the VMP is not accurate because of different effects on on the VMP levels, but the NT Pro VMP is. So if a patient's on interest, they should be using the NT Pro VMP. But I think we're going to have to change in the hospital because uh, there's so many patients coming in on interest now, um, especially in the emergency room where they use a you know, as the studies have shown, they use it appropriately to try to, and so it's just not accurate. The BMP could be falsely elevated in patients on interest now. Um, so for those reasons, it's going to have to change. Um, I think we're discussing that with the hospital now about about getting those in. Well, I've, I actually like BMP much better because, I guess I'm used to it maybe, but it's such a smaller value. You know, the NT pro BMP, it ranges from thousands to thousands, where the BMP, you know, you get, a, I think, a better idea. If it's over 1,000, the patient's pretty sick, or at least my patients. You know, if, if I am get them to 700, I'm happy. That's just based on my experience. But <laughs> the, the NT pro BMP, I still haven't got to, I'm using it a lot because of Entresa, but I just haven't got a good handle on what the values mean because there's such a wide range. Even in the trials, one trial used 1,000, one used 3,000. So what is the right number? You know, I don't have a good sense personally. Maybe more digging, I'll get it. But the VMP is a much more narrow window. So I, I like it actually better. But it's a problem with the, with interest zone. Well, even in patients who come in, especially like these women coming in with very low VMP, but even with a patient. Yeah, know. sorry, I didn't mention that. Yeah, you said, yeah, you mentioned obesity. Obesity is the hardest because your physical exam will be the worst. Uh, BMP will be completely off. And their symptoms could be multifactorial. I think it's just a very difficult patient population. Sometimes you diurese them and see what happens. If they get, you know, if their kidneys start worsening and so on, and you think they're borderline, maybe that's a sign they're actually relatively too dry. That's, you know, that's one way of doing it. That's a good question. Uh, I didn't pull up the data on that. I, I think it can be, it, it can be a helpful thing if you have access to that at all times. Um, but I would have to look back exactly what the data shows regarding the IVC. But it's obviously not going to be commonplace given you know, our limitations of doing it. But every patient who of mine who have had an echo, I'll definitely go check that. Um, I don't do it myself because uh, I don't have a handheld echo, but people are walking around with these things sometimes. But I'll go look at it just to prove, you know, either to, to say I was right or I was wrong. But I think it can be helpful if we were going to use that more. Uh, one thing that's, you know, cheap and easy is the change in hemo concentration. Um, so uh, this was a trial that looked at, what about just looking at that? So if you have increased hemoglobin, hematocrit, albumin, total protein, uh, does that have any prognostic significance? And really it did. Patients who uh, had hemo concentration, they did have a lower incidence of mortality. Uh, they did have worsening renal function, but despite that, they actually did better long-term, both 90-day uh, um, and long-term mortality. Um, I'll skip through these a bit, but you know, you know, these are what we, you know, these are more uh, therapies that are going to be used in the CCU, so not so much on the medicine floors, even on the cardiology floors, not so much, uh, but just vasodilator therapy. What is the benefit in vasodilator therapy? Um, if you look up here, uh, with vasodilator therapy, you could decrease your afterload, um, shift upon the curve, and increase your stroke volume. And, and different medicines we have to use this are nitroglycerin, uh, nitroprusside, nisiratide. Nisiratide has actually been taken off the market, so it's no longer available. Uh, so we're left with nitroglycerin and nitroprusside that can be very helpful, but they require monitoring of these patients, um, and they could really only be used in a CCU for, as far as vasodilator therapy. But in the right cases, um, they really can be helpful. Um, and inotropic therapy, uh, we do use this more on the floors uh, now, especially on you know, seven center units. Um, and it's for patients who you place into that box we showed initially that they are congested and hypoperfused. Um, giving an inotrope can help these patients. Um, but keep in mind, there's no randomized trial that ever demonstrated any efficacy of these agents. All right, We know it works. Um, uh, but the trials, the way it was looked at in the trials, it really didn't. And probably it's because of the negative side effects that can happen with these drugs. So you think about it when you know, we say beating a dead horse, you're increasing myocardial oxygen consumption. You can increase arrhythmias related to that and so on. Um, and you know, the ones we typically see are the beta milrin and dopamine. Um, milrinone is probably our drug of choice um, because it is, uh, you know, because it, it has the combined vasodilator and inotropic properties. 
Uh, you could also keep patients on beta blockers when you're using the milrinone, so it's nice if you're trying to titrate someone off of milrinone, if you already have them on a beta blocker. If they're having arrhythmias, it's nice to have them on a beta blocker and so on. Um, but again, when it was looked at in the OpTime CHF trial, which is a trial that looked at uh, patients who just came in with acute high fever, not low output patients, not hyperperfusing, but just patient, putting patients on it from the get-go, did increase hypotension and increase atrial arrhythmias, and there was a non-significant increase in mortality, so it really is not, should not be used uh, for that um, indication. And that's what the guidelines will read out. I won't read the whole thing. But there are cases you do need it when you need to bridge a patient to more advanced therapies. Um, when you're bri so it's more as a bridge therapy than anything. But in using it in your run-of-the-mill heart failure patient um, is actually a class three, so harm. You could be causing harm to the patient based on those trials. So use it, but use it carefully only when you need it in certain cases. And the patients need to be closely monitored. That being said, we send patients home on melanin all the time, uh, but they're patients with ICDs. Uh, who have been monitored in the hospital on the milliron, and then it's shown to be okay. Uh, but again, it just shows how sick that patient is that they need to go home on milliron therapy, and it should only be used as probably hospice or a bridge for the patient. Um, other therapies that I've looked at, perhaps tolvaptin is something you know we hear about it is available in the hospital. It's extremely expensive, um, but perhaps it's enticing those patients who come in hyponatremic and volume overloaded. Um, because it could both cure their hyponatremia and perhaps contribute to uh, diuresis. Um, but when studied in the Everest outcome trial, there was no change in the primary endpoint of all cause of mortality, cardiovascular death, or hospitalization for heart failure. It did improve some secondary endpoints, um, including dyspnea, body weight, um, and edema. Uh, Surlaxin and Nularitide, that they're both not available in here. Uh, Surlaxin is used sometimes in Europe, but not available in the US. And really, the uh, guidelines, what did they say about tovaptin? So in patients hospitalized with volume overload, heart failure, who have persistent severe hyponatremia um, and, and are at risk for cognitive, cognitive symptoms despite water restriction and maximization of guideline therapy. So these are really sick patients who are not responding to anything else. You could consider using it in those uh, patients. Um, just to show you, you know, all these trials looked at all these different medicines, um, uh, IV melanone, uh, levosimendin, tovaptin. So, you know, we're all looking for improvement with these uh, with these IV medications or different medications. And really, there are not that many that actually showed positive outcomes. We mentioned the average trial with uh, uh, with tovaptin that that showed some weight loss and some uh, assessment in secondary outcomes. Uh, relaxed HF, which was serolaxin, showed some improvement in dyspnea day five. And then the unload trial, which we talked about before, which is ultrafiltration, and it showed greater fluid removal and weight loss at 24 hours with ultrafiltration, but really no amazing outcomes coming from any of these uh, trials. So it just shows how it's very difficult to treat these patients, or perhaps we're not studying these patients correctly, and we'll talk about that quickly. So just a case, we have Mrs. Jones. Uh, she has AHA, ACC, stage C heart failure uh, with a reduced injection fraction. She has baseline class two symptoms, but she comes into the ER with uh, dyspnea, bendopnea, orthopnea, and edema. And she admits that she, you know, she, uh, while she was away on vacation, she wasn't eating the way she was supposed to. Uh, she takes 40 milligrams of BID of Lasix at home. So you see her, you treat her according to the dose algorithm, al algorithm so 200 milligrams of IV Lasix, uh, right? So you do two and a half times her PO dose, and she responds well. But her creatinine goes up from 1.2 to 1.9, and she's still symptomatic. So we see this patient all the time, right? Um, so what, what do you do? Should you reduce the dose? Could, should you keep on diuresing her? What should you do with a patient like this? And we all struggle with this. We all hate to see uh, worsening renal function. Uh, any, it's a common in heart failure. Um, it is traditionally associated with our, our, uh, worse outcomes, and probably most importantly, it really scares us when we see it. Um, but if you look at some of the studies, you know, transient worsening of renal function may really not affect post-discharge outcomes. We already mentioned two trials that showed this. One is the DOSE trial that did show that they had uh, transient worsening, um, but um, in the end, it didn't lead to worse outcomes. Um, and sometimes it may just be a trade-off for the congestion that the patient needs, right? So especially in these HEFCO patients, they all have kidney disease, and, and sometimes they just need higher diuretic doses, and you have to sacrifice creatinine uh, to get that. Maybe that's okay, because um, what's probably worse is that if you have fun uh, worsening renal function and you're still congested, that's a that's a very bad sign. So you do keep on uh, diuresing her. Grand is now 2.1. She has no edema, no JVT, but she's still symptomatic, and her blood pressure is now in the 80s. 
So although you think you released, uh, you relieved that congestion, you, um, she's still symptomatic and has a low blood pressure. And if you think back on that first table we talked about, this would be someone who's um, cold and dry, right? Um, perhaps. Um, but do we know that, and should we go to prove that in any way? So that's when uh, perhaps you should think about a right heart catheterization, right? When we really don't know exactly what's going on in the patient or we're concerned that they've reached this low output syndrome, I think that's times we consider it, and anyone could, no matter where you're from uh, in, the, in the hospital. It's something to always think about or probably get a um, cardiology or heart failure consult at that time to try to help manage this patient because this is a sign of a sick patient. Um, and while, you know, we've moved away from uh, swans in the, C in the ICUs and so on, they still do have a role in these, in these patients, um, just perhaps not as general as they were being used before. Uh, but with the guidelines, it's a class one recommendation for respiratory distress or suspected low perfusion uh, in whom assessment of the intracardiac filling pressures is really unclear or a class 2A for persistent symptoms despite uh, therapies when the blood pressure is low, the renal function is worsening, you know, everything we kind of uh, talked about. One strategy may be if you see a patient like that, just put them on norinone and see what happens. And we don't do that. We do that not infrequently either, right? Where um, prove it by the response of the patient to the therapy that you would be giving them anyways if you put a swan catheter in. Um, so it just all depends on how comfortable you are with starting these therapies. Uh, but I would say probably most often we just put them on norinone and see what happens. Um, sometimes, though, it's nice to prove why you did that. So you look back, like, oh, you know, we all rotate every two weeks. And then the next person comes on, they're like, oh, why did he go on norinone? So sometimes it's nice to just to document you had that right heart cath that showed low filling pressures and low cardiac output despite doing everything you can rather than the next attending saying, oh, no, I'm smarter than that one. I'll put them back. And, and we do that, too, all the time. So, um, What about prognosis in these patients? So this was the ADHERE registry that looked at uh, 65,000 hospitalizations for heart failure, trying to look at what, uh, what are bad prognostic indicators in these patients. And um, looking at uh, all the data they had, they narrowed it down to some predictors of mortality, which was a BUN over 48, uh, SPP less than 115, um, and a creatinine over 2.75. And based on using these, you were able to separate patients with about a 21% risk of mortality versus 2%. So again, I don't know how helpful this is to us, but at least it's helpful to recognize that patient coming into the hospital, how sick is this patient, and how concerned should we be going forward. Um, and um, all these are all lists of some prognostic indicators that have been proven at times, uh, low blood pressure, CAD, troponin, um, ventricular dys dyssynchrony on EKG, um, basically renal impairment, hyponatremia, uh, just an ejection fraction in itself, um, clinical congestion at time of discharge. Again, we mentioned if you don't congest the patient, they're decongest the patient, they're going to do worse. Uh, 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 BNP levels we went through, and then just how the patient is feeling at the time of discharge. Um, so it would be nice if we could say, let's find one of these and then treat it and let the patient get better. But we, that's what we're lacking is studies showing benefit for treating these. these. So it seems these are more markers of disease rather than treatment targets. Um, and, you know, we mentioned the persist, uh, persistent congestion. And this is a study looking at that orthedema score we measured um, and how patients did uh, who still had elevated orthedema scores when they left the hospital. And um, they did have an increase, the ones with higher scores did have an increased risk of death, rehospitalizations, and unscheduled visits. So, again, it's something try to get your patient as best as you can prior to leaving. And I know we're all pressured by, um, you know, lengths of stay and discharges. But if you don't do right by the patient, that they will just be right back. Um, you know, one thing to look at in the study, but even in the patients you treated properly, look at how high the discharge event rate was. Um, you know, even you know, 50 percent of the patients uh, had one of these events. So these are just sick patients um, in general, the heart failure patients that we're treating. One thing we also know is that with increasing hospitalizations, uh, you have increased uh, cumulative mortality. So your first admission, second admission, by your fourth admission, uh, you, you, you know, a very high uh, rate of mortality. So it's just something to in the back of our heads when we're admitting a patient. If this is a patient's second or third time in the hospital, that's a time to think about calling uh, cardiology or heart failure to, to see these patients, because whether you think they look good or not, these are obviously sick patients that you're dealing with. Um, and what are we doing at Mount Sinai in terms of heart failure? So we do have heart failure nurse navigators that go to the medicine floors, I believe. Um, uh, they review diet, medication, and lifestyle changes with the patients. You could email this hashtag HFACTT 
I think to make aware the, the navigator that you need, uh, that you would like them to see the patients. So we have booklets we give out, they have bags they give out with certain things. Um, so I think there's a lot of resources. Uh, we just have to use them properly. Um, of course, there's always a heart failure consult available for those high risk cases. Um, and if you have an issue getting a consult, you could always let me know, happy to help. I know, we again, we run busy services, so, um, but we always have time when we need it. Um, and then we, we run a rapid follow-up clinic. So uh, the goal is to have every patient uh, who's discharged with a diagnosis of heart failure to be seen within a week of discharge. And it really works well, and we've shown a lot of benefit doing this. Other trials have shown benefit doing this. Um, and it's run by Jennifer Allman, one of our nurse practitioners mainly. So they see her within a week after discharge, um, and she'll go through the medications, uh, make sure they're okay, and also plug them into the right place afterwards. So I think that's something we could also use. And again, you could email this if you need any help with that. Um, some other things we're looking at, this is uh, called the REDS uh, vest. Um, so it's a vest that was invented by uh, the Israeli military, actually, to use to look through walls. Uh, but it was, I'm not an engineer, but it uses low power electromagnetic signals that are emitted into the body. Um, and based on that, you could see the relative ratio of water um, and air and really predict uh, fluid accumulation. Um, and we, we did a trial of using this in the hospital um, and prior to discharge, and we were using it a lot more, more so on the outpatient. So they're coming to their rapid follow-up clinic, getting the vest put on like you see in this picture. It has to go on the right side of the chest, um, and it measures in the uh, fluid at the right upper, uh, right mid lobe. Um, and we have a range of normal pressures, um, and you would target getting that patient back into that range if possible. Um, and it's uh, there's been studies that show correlation with uh, wedge pressure with invasive hemodynamics and the reds vest. So it seems like a promising technology. It's just figuring out where the best place to use it is. Uh, perhaps this could be used in the emergency department instead of your BNP. You know, use this. Uh, perhaps in the outpatient clinic and SNFs, home monitoring, and even in the hospital wards to see if that patient is appropriately decongested to go home. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's a great technology. We own two of these, and we're trying to use them and figure out the best way to use them. Um, and, you know, this is something, you know, I believe in a lot, which is the CardioMEMS. I don't know how many people have heard of the CardioMEMS device, but it's an implantable pulmonary artery hemodynamic monitoring system. So... We implant this in the cath lab into the pulmonary artery. Um, it allows, uh, then it allows patients to transmit their pulmonary artery pressures every day they transmit to our office um, in order to detect uh, buildup of congestion prior to them becoming symptomatic. And uh, this was the champion trial I'm showing here. It showed really great results in terms of reducing um, uh, readmissions. Uh, patients felt better, both in HEFPEF and HEFREF. So it's actually the only therapy we have for HEFPEF that has had positive outcomes. Um, so we have about 35 patients we follow with this, and uh, we implant them. It's the same day you go home that night. Um, works right away. Um, really, no, we haven't had much adverse events at all with the implantation. It's pretty safe overall. Um, so it's, it's a good therapy we probably underutilize. And, you know, the question is how to use this in, in patients. Hopefully the patients get this. They never come back to the hospital, but they do. And we're able to check, um, we're able to check their pressures while they're in the hospital too, just as a more a specific marker of congestion. Um, so I'll just end with this. This was uh, this. You know, this is uh, Chris O'Connor. He's the editor of Jack Heart Failure, um, and just looking at why we're failing at treating acute heart failure. So you know, some of his points are well taken. You know, we don't understand the pathophysiology as thoroughly as we can. You know, unlike ACS, we must do more work in this capacity. We know how to treat patients who come in with an MI. They get a stent because it's a blockage. You open the blockage, but we don't understand the same thing in heart failure patients. You know, I didn't go through this, but a lot of the studies that were looked at, there, they show giving a drug for 48 hours. So they would give milanone or Cirilaxin for 48 hours when the patient comes in. How do we expect 48 hours of an IV infusion to change long-term outcomes in these patients when it's such a complicated uh, process? Uh, and really, you know, one of his conclusions was we should really focus on that transition of care. Um, and it seems like uh, we know how to prognosticate, but we don't know how to stop that. And, and probably one of the best ways to do that is proper handoffs, getting them decongested, Getting them to the right physicians after they leave the hospital, that's probably the best thing that we can do for our patients. And this is just our group. Uh, we've grown over the past few years. There's even one more added to this now. So, again, if you see us, feel free to stop us, ask us for help if you need, or any, any way we can help, we'll be happy to. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. So the, um, the vest looks really promising. Yeah. 
my question is, is it, it's, it's kind of worded that the vest you have to wear continuously, but could it just be a time, like a periodic measurement? Sorry, that's, the that's the way we're using it, yeah, as a periodic measurement. So everyone who comes to the office that day will have the vest put on, you get a measurement, and you take it off. Yeah, so there, and yeah. So it, it, yeah, it would be nice in the hospital to do yeah. that before you discharge a patient to measure it. So it is some way it could be used. Another category, you say, oh, this patient is likely ready to go to be discharged, or I would like to discharge Yeah. But I think at some point there's going to be a trade off between readmissions and, and discharge. And I think that's, you know, we probably have the long, longest length of stays in the hospital, but we keep patients a long time. So that's what it takes sometimes. I think that, you know. Yeah, it's a good, there are a few uh, contraindications to the vest. Uh, pneumonia can uh, be one, especially if it's on the right side. An ICD on the right side won't, it won't work as well, which is, come, you know, most patients think, thankfully have it on the left side. Um, but there are si certain situations where it, the use is contraindicated. I, I, I forgot that slide. There is, a, again, they did compare it to wedge pressures, and it showed a, it was really, you know, it really correlated well with wedge pressures. But there are certain situations we wouldn't use it. Um, obese, obese patients. The the average dose in the trial, I have to pull it up, but it was at that high dose. Again, one thing to remember with the trial, though, which is something to always caution about, these patients uh, showed tolerability to get into the trial. So they had to tolerate doses of enalapril, um, I think it was close to 18 milligrams a day. So th these patients were tolerating very high doses to get into the trial. If you didn't tolerate those doses, you didn't get into the trial. So that's another caution I always tell you know physicians and patients is that um, these these were a highly selected group of patients that actually got into the trial. Um, it raises the BNP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, so that's why we check NT pro BNP levels. It doesn't affect that, but it affects the BNP level. So it will be falsely elevated in those patients. Yeah. All right, thank you guys.